So my third speaker today is uh, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I'd say latte, but I'm not going to <laughs> for, for latte. Oh, all right, only joking. Uh, Olivia uh, came to Vancouver in 2004 with a degree in sexology from the University of Quebec in Montreal. Ever since, he's been an active member of the gay men's movement in British Columbia. Olivia is currently the research education director at the community-based research centre for gay men's health and a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. Uh, Olivia wants to do uh, a postdoctoral study with John Olaf <laughs> at University of British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> and um, his interests in include um, homophobia, violence and stigma on the health and lives of sexual minorities as well as the application of intersectionality and cis mm, syndemic theory. Maybe I'm not the supervisor for you. <laughs> syndemic theory. <laughs> have to find someone else, sorry. Uh, um, uh, to, to gay men's health. Please welcome Olivia. I'll send my list of requests uh, for a uh, requirement, a uh, foot massage at the end of the day. And <laughs> so uh, as John is really uh, my biggest competition for the prize of the most entertaining moderator at the summit. <laughs> I better step up my game tomorrow. So uh, uh, today the work that I'm going to present is actually still in progress. So I welcome critiques. Um, uh, suggestion, funding, uh, so uh, feel free uh, to approach uh, me. And the work that I'm going to present can be seen as a bit of a continuity of the work that Joshin present as we are exploring uh, intersex now data, some of the factor that increase um, suicide attempt among gay men, gay and bisexual men. And this time in this study, we look more specifically uh, around uh, social identities and social location. Whoops. So a bit of the background information. Suicide is no different than any other uh, health or social problems. Uh, it is not uh, evenly distributed across population. And it is, seems to be affecting um, uh, more some of the groups that are most marginalized in society and some of the ones that are reported in suicide writing or Aboriginal men, gay and bisexual men. Uh, men that live in uh, rural and remote community. And while these groups are not um, mutually exclusive, because you know they can be a gay Aboriginal man living in a rural setting, uh, they, they, these groups are kind of treated as such as mutually exclusive in the literature, and there's very little attention about diversity among those groups, which can really create a vacuum of knowledge, and particularly diversity have not been attended uh, at all or very little in the research on suicide of gay and bisexual men. So this is where th we're coming from. So in, the, in doing this research, we had kind of two like overarching questions. First of all, one that relate to prevention. If we want to prevent uh, uh, effectively suicide uh, pr um, attempt among gay and bisexual men, we need to know who are the men that are attempting uh, suicide. And we also had a research question related to research methods, and th those, that's it's for maybe the geeky or epidemiologists in the room, or those that are interested in research method. But in that case, we were interested, is intersectionality a useful framework to study gain by sexual men's inequity, such as suicide? So we're taking that as an example. If you haven't heard about intersectionality before, we probably haven't had a conversation in the last four years. <laughs> because I've been told I bring it the, all the time and too much. And actually, my boyfriend declared her bedroom an intersectionally free zone last week. <laughs> so uh, I'm not even lying. <laughs> so intersectionality uh, actually has a very long history in social science, particularly about, uh, uh, among black feminists and indigenous uh, feminist scholars. But it has really grown in popularity over the last 10 years. And even in the last five years, we hear more and more about it. And if you look at what's been written about intersectionality, you'll probably find a lot of uh, different definitions. But they are a central concept to um, intersectionality. Um, sorry. 
and uh, which is that social and health inequities are never like the result of a singular factor, but more so uh, the result of uh, the outcome of different and intersecting social location, so those related to uh, sexuality, class, gender identity, and also the intersection of different form of power. So we're talking about classism, homophobia, um, racism, so I don't want to, I'm not going to give you a one-on-one -on -one course on intersectionality, but it hasn't really been uh, recognized in recent years as being an important framework to really help advance how we think about uh, gay men's health and how we theorize it, how we actually uh, do health promotion and how we research it. So there's a lot of advantages of using an intersectionality approach that people are recognizing. And in the context of this study, uh, the main advantage is that uh, the value added of using intersectionality is that it really helped challenge the homogeneity of the gay and bisexual men community by recognizing that gay and bi men are differently positioned because of their class, their gender identity, their ethnicity, their aboriginal status, and therefore there's the different degree of penalties and privileges within our community. And this may kind of seem very, very obvious for any one of us that kind of engage in a community, um, but it has actually is not really reflecting and uh, reflected in uh, most of the research. So as I said before, what we, I'm going to be presenting is some research that we're doing with a sex now survey. So we're looking at quantitative uh, method. And intersectionality, it's important to point out intersectionality is actually not a method of doing something. Rather, it's a framework that try to bring a, concept, a conceptual shift into how researchers uh, consider uh, social categories. And in public health, how social categories are usually seen is as mutually exclusive. And research tend to, when they do research with social identities, they tend to try to look at the independent effect of a category. So the independent effect of sexuality or the dependent independent effect of Aboriginal status on an outcome. Intersectionality, uh, quantitative research, is actually a very new concept and it's the only starting to emerge. Uh, but in this approach, uh, social categories are uh, seen as being co-constitutive, co uh, and researchers try to account for the conditional effect of intersecting categories on health outcome by looking at how the two different uh, social categories, for example, sexuality and class, may actually uh, interact and create better or worse health outcome. So that was the most kind of geeky part, so you can wake up a bit now as I present the data. Um, so as I said, I, we focus on suicide and try to identify who have attempted suicide in the last 12 months. That's the data that we're using uh, in that research, who have attempted suicide in the last 12 months among gay and bisexual men. And overall, about 1.7% of uh, gay and bisexual men attempted suicide in the last 12 months and are simple. So it may seem kind of little, but it's one in almost one in 50, so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty big. So we wanted to focus only in the last 12 months because in intersectionality, social categories are understood as being flexible and fluid, so obviously your social, ca your social capital may change over time, so your, obviously your class can change, but also how you identify your sexual identity uh, may change, your ethnicity can be uh, a disadvantage or penal penalty different depending of the context. So we focus only in the last 12 months. So because we were interested of seeing in a value added of using intersectionality, we had to first do the traditional approach uh, that public health are doing by looking, you know, what is the independent effect of uh, of a social category on uh, a suicide attempt in the last 12 months. So we did that by entering, you know, uh, all our or all our social categories into one model and look at those effects. So by doing this method, uh, what we found is that when we were looking at bisexual, uh, sexual orientation, partnership, or age, we were not seeing any differences among us, uh, among the men on those categories. Uh, although uh, ethnicity, we were seeing a, quite a dramatic difference uh, with our Aboriginal men, where uh, the average is 1.7, but Aboriginal men, 4.2% of them, have uh, attempted suicide in the last 12 months. And uh, unfortunately, 
uh, if you're familiar with odd ratio and looking at the confidence of interval, you'll probably, tell, you'll probably see that it was not significant in, in our model. And probably because we didn't have that many uh, Aboriginal men in our survey, we only had 168. So that's perhaps why it's not significant. And we should not let statistical significance showing us that there's, telling us that there's probably not an issue going on there. Looking at our other social location, what we saw is that we were looking, depending of where someone lived, urban, suburban, or rural setting, they were, they didn't seem to be any difference uh, in, in that, and no difference with HIV status. But what we're seeing is that huge differences according to education level and income. So people that didn't have a university degree were three times more likely to report a suicide attempt in the last 12 months, and those who had an income under $30,000 uh, a year, we're also three times more likely to report a suicide attempt in the last 12 months. So this is what we learn when we do the traditional approach uh, that public health or epidemiologists do, or most of them. And when we look at the intersectional approach, so looking at the multiplicative interfect intersecting effect of social categories. This is a bit the method that we do. So first of all, we test it for all possible interaction by putting them in SPSS. So uh, there was 28 two-way interaction that we measured. So for example, we look at, is there an interaction between sexual orientation and partnership status? Is there one with sexual orientation and education and so on? Um, and then we calculated the odd ratio for all the one that came significant. And after uh, and that I'm going to be presenting. We also, I want to say, tested for three-way interaction, but none of them, we didn't have enough power because a uh, suicide w attempt was a, kind of a, only 1.7%. So at that point, we were unable to compute them. So here's the result of our interaction. When we look at the interaction between one of them that was significant is income and education. And what you're going to see here is... I'm going to use the buzzer. Here are the men, all the men that have a university degree. And I want, among the men who have a university degree, in, the, uh, in pink you have the one that are uh, doing more than $30,000 $30, a year, and here less than $30,000 a year. And what you can probably see just by the graph is there's no difference. So if you have a university degree, it doesn't matter your uh, your income, you are not an increased risk of suicide. But where we see a huge differences with the inter uh, interaction is uh, in the people that have no university degree. So the one that had no university degree and a higher income uh, uh, had a rate quite similar to the one with a university degree, but there was a huge dramatic increase among the men who had no university degree and uh, an income lower than $30,000 a year. Here we look at the interaction between orientation and partnership status. And although we see a nice gradient with the gay men, which is over here, uh, those are not statistically significant. But what we're seeing is all in the bisexual men, we see a, a gradient that's quite interesting. The bisexual men in blue are the ones that are partnered or married to a man. And they were at increased risk of uh, attempted suicide, particularly when we compare them to the ones that are uh, partnered or married to a woman, who are actually partnership with a woman may be a, actually a protective factor for suicide among uh, bisexual men uh, according to that interaction. Now we're looking at an interaction between environment and education. Having a university degree, um, it w the interaction was only significant with urban men, but we see that there's potentially a same uh, kind of pattern with suburban men, and maybe just an issue of statistical power. But among a rural and remote men, there was no difference whether you had a university degree or not. And again, we look another uh, uh, interaction that was significant was um, uh, with uh, the environment and the income. And although they kind of show all the same kind of gradient, only the urban men uh, were statistically significant. So the impact of uh, income may be felt greater for urban men. So in case I totally lost you, I'm going to summarize what I just described in uh, the last 10 slides. So who are more at risk of suicide? If we follow the traditional approach uh, of social categories of public health, we would learn two things about the men that are more at risk of suicide. They are either uh, have a lower income or they do not have a university degree. But when we use intersectionality, 
uh, we actually were able to produce a bit more uh, nuanced result. Actually, men were at increased risk of suicide attempt if they had a lower income and a lower uh, education. So there's a, a potentially a conditional effect there. Also, we were able to show that bisexual men uh, that are partnered with a man are at increased risk of suicide and that the impact of lower education and lower income may be particularly important for men that live in urban setting. So what are the implications of that work? I was trying to think, well, well, how can we do better prevention? I don't think we can do better prevention because we're not doing much prevention. So I think we need to start having a, we need a prevention strategy for gay and bisexual men. And it's not that we need to target only the men that are a lower income and lower education, because all gay men are increase, seem to be at increased risk of suicide. But we really need to have a strategy uh, that accounts for the diversity of experience in our community, particularly along the axis of class, geography, and Aboriginal status. In terms of research, there's a few implications here. Uh, first of all, using intersectionality and taking into account the intersecting factors, the intersection of um, effect of social categories show much more nuanced result. And we need better representation of different group of gay and bisexual men if we want to do that approach. And one of, that I'm putting there is Aboriginal men. And that may, means that we, when we do survey like sex now, we may want to oversample uh, those groups to make sure that we're able to show interaction with them. And we need more research suicide. And that goes beyond demonstrating that we're at increased risk of suicide. We need to kind of identify factors and how we can uh, decrease the rate, and that may include quantitative research, but I think qualitative research, and John is involved in very cool art-based work, uh, or work like um, Elizabeth is doing around looking at policy uh, that can actually improve uh, this issue. I just want to acknowledge the funder of Vancouver Foundation, my study team, and all the investigators that work with us for the SexNow survey. And if you have questions, funding, or you know, want to talk more about intersectionality, uh, we can do that, but not in my bedroom. So you can email me, um, I, and you can tweet us or, or Facebook us. I didn't say you cannot come in my bedroom. I just say we cannot talk about intersectionality. I just want to make this clear. 